Okay, so the next two days we're introducing you to the data structures, lists, and then sets and maps. And we are going to be showing you the API, so the operations that are done on them, which not surprisingly are, what are the three operations we're concerned with? Find, insert, delete. Okay, so those are the three main operations, but there are some other operations that go with each of them because each of them kind of has its own bells and whistles. So today we'll be tackling lists, stacks, and queues, and dequeues, which are double-ended queues. And then on uh, Thursday we'll be tackling sets and maps. So lists, you are familiar with lists, okay? A list is just like a grocery list or um, a list of to-do items that you make. It literally is just a list of items, okay? And as you might know with a very long unordered list, it's not particularly good for finding things, okay? Because normally with a list, you do a linear scan through it. So you're probably just from your own personal experience of writing a bunch of things down, lists aren't perhaps the most efficient search structure. But they are more efficient than arrays for something that is very important, and that is being able to insert into the middle of them. So we've been telling you repeatedly that it's a bad idea to insert anywhere into an array but at the end of the array. And it turns out that with lists, it's efficient to insert into the front of the list or the middle of the list or the end of the list. And just to show you why quickly, I am going to peek ahead for a moment and Remember, we also have gone over pointers, and they are important for lists. So what's going to happen is with a list, we are going to have what we call nodes that store our values. So item 1, or I'll call it item 0 because we always do. And then you can see it's going to use pointers to point to the next item. and so on. Okay, so it's using pointers, and every time we need a new item, let's say item 3, we first of all we're going to allocate memory for that new item using new. So we would execute a new command and assign it item 3, and then let's say that we have a pointer already to item 2, I can insert in front of it. I know it looks like I want to insert in back of it, but let's call it item 2.5. So you think, ah, it really is supposed to go between, well, call it item 1.5. <laughs> so you think, ah, it really is supposed to go between 1 and 2. So it turns out that what you can do is you can, actually you also need a pointer to item 1, so what often happens is we also have so-called back pointers. So instead of having what we call a singly linked list, we actually normally have a doubly linked list. So we both point to the next item in the list and the previous item in the list. So if we have a pointer to item two, we can get to the previous item, which is item one, and we can insert item 1.5 into there by redoing some arrows making item 2 point back to here, making item 1.5 point to there, and getting rid of this. So after we get through with introducing you to the API, we get into how we actually set up these lists. Okay, so if you see the notes, eventually we get to linked data structures next week. 
and that's where we actually talk about how we do this. Okay, so just keep in mind what we're essentially talking about when we talk about lists in the standard template library is these doubly linked lists with each list item having a value and then a pointer to the next item in the list and a pointer to the previous item in the list. And just to finish the picture, we also have what are called sentinel nodes, which don't have values, but which still have are considered part of the list. So I'm putting X's there. Okay, these things, the two, these two, are called sentinel nodes. Okay, if you're familiar with the sentinel, it guards a camp, right? A sentinel is like an, in the army means it's guarding a camp or a fortification. Here the sentinel nodes are, quote, guarding the two ends of the list. Okay. Now, I just conceptually, that's what the doubly linked list looks like. Okay. So any questions about that? Okay, so again, we're, we're going to look more at the high level today, not at the low level. So here's a very simple example of using a list. And what we're going to do is read in a bunch of lines, and then they're going to be printed out in reverse order. Okay, so something that is very simple. Okay, just to show you what we're going to do. Let's say that we have four items or four pieces of input, three, six, ten, and two. What we're going to do is push each of them onto the front of the list. So three will go onto the list first. Then we'll add the next item, which is six, to the front of the list. Then we'll add ten to the front of the list. Then we'll add two to the front of the list, which, as you can see, effectively reverses the order of the input. Right? So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so the first thing, just like we have to include a vector, we need to include a list structure from our standard template library. And the declaration is just like a vector, except it's a list, and you say what it's going to store just like you would with a vector. So we're storing a list of strings here. Now, where we differ is we can't use numeric or positional indices to access items in a list. Okay? Because the list uses pointers rather than contiguous memory, it's not, you can't get a calculation of where the position of the ith item is. Okay? What makes vectors so efficient is that they're in contiguous memory, so if you know the starting location and you know the index is i, you can immediately jump to the ith location. Okay, you have an address. You don't have that with a linked list. If you want the ith element in a linked list, you have to do a serial or linear search from the beginning. Okay, so we no longer with a list can use numeric indices. Instead, we use something called iterators. Okay, an iterator is a way of traversing a collection of items. So this is going to be a ubiquitous term. An iterator um, is a device for traversing a collection of items. Because remember, what we're interested in this course is storing a dynamic set of items and being able to traverse it efficiently. Okay, so you're going to find out that iterators are used with maps and sets and DQs and actually can be used with vectors too. Although we use indices because that's more efficient with vectors. So what a iterator is going to do is it provides a way, basically, 
when the first time you get an iterator, it points to the first item. Then you keep moving it. Each time you move it, it moves to the next item in the list. And I know this lit, um, whoops, this is now, would move to here next because that's item 1.5 and finally would move here. So I'm going to use a different color. So first the iterator would be there, then the iterator would be there, then the iterator would move to here, and finally the iterator would move to here, and the last place it would move would be right there. Okay, so in this case, this is the first, this is the second, this is the third, this is the fourth, and this is the fifth place it moves. No, it does not. Okay, so that's really important is that when you, the first thing that you get when you request an iterator, it's initialized to point to the first item in the list, and it ignores this sentinel node at the beginning. Okay, so this is a very simple program. While get line, we call push front. So push front is a method that pushes a string onto the front of the list rather than the back of the list. Then when we're done, we're going to use this iterator to iterate through the list. So lit was declared as an iterator. So lines.begin returns an iterator and that iterator points to the first item in the list. Okay, the way we move the iterator to the next item in the list is with the plus plus. This is an example of operator overloading because normally plus plus means increment by one, right? And it's an arithmetic operation. Here, it's been overloaded so that what it does is still has the notion of incrementing by one, but now what we're doing is moving to the next item in the list. And we terminate when the iterator points to the sentinel node at the end of the list. So this is where it can get a little confusing because lines.end, logically, if lines.begins returns an iterator that points to the first item in the list, you would think that lines.end would return turn an iterator that points to the last item in the list. But it doesn't. It returns an iterator that points to the sentinel node at the end of the list. So, kind of the end of the list, right? So, begin, this is so lit dot begin returns a pointer to the first item in the list, lit.end, returns something that points to the sentinel node at the end of the list. And I'll try to get rid of this irritating that did the trick? Yeah, that did the trick. Okay. So lit.end, pointer to the sentinel node at the end, lit.begin, pointer to the first item. Okay, and these are actual iterators that are getting returned with lines.begin and lines.end. They return iterators. Okay, the way we get to the value of that list item is with the asterisk, which mimics what? What are they mimicking with this asterisk? Dereferencing a pointer. So they're making it look like the iterator is a pointer. It's not. It's an object but they've overloaded the asterisk operator to make it look like dereferencing a pointer. That returns the value of that list item, which in this case is a string. Okay, and because as you, um, as you can see here, the items were put in reverse order what we'll get back is 2, 10, 6, 3, and we'll end up printing the items in 
reverse order. So this is a very simple program. Okay? The only difference really between it and a vector is we're putting the elements at the front of the list rather than at the end because it's just as efficient to put them at the front as it is at the back because of pointers. Okay, so we're good with this simple example? Okay, so maybe what we want to do is go backwards through the list. We'd like to start at the end of the list and move from the right to the left toward the front. And we can do that with reverse iterators. So here is a reverse iterator. And this time we're going to again reverse the elements in the list. So again we have 3, 6, 10, 2, but this time we actually add them in that order. 3, then 6, then 10, then 2, and the way we're going to print things in reverse order is we're going to have an iterator that goes from the back toward the front. Well in this case we're going to use r.begin. So we had a reverse iterator we use r.begin. This is confusing. What might you think that should be if we're going in reverse? Minus, minus. Try it, it won't work. Okay? So you have to use plus plus even with a reverse iterator. The notion being that you are still going to the next item just in reverse. Okay? And r.begin returns an iterator now to the first item at the back and lines.rn returns a iterator that points to the sentinel node at the beginning of the list. So now with having two sentinel nodes on the list, this is what r.begin returns and this is what r dot end. So r dot begin returns a pointer to the last item in the list. r dot end returns a pointer to the sentinel node at the beginning of the list. And it's not a pointer, it's an iterator that it returns. Okay, it actually is returning an iterator. That iterator points to the sentinel node. Okay, so the same thing except now we use pushback because we're adding to the end of the list, everything else, well, it's not the same because you were using R begin, R end, but we're still printing using the asterisk. Now, notice one thing I've been skipping over is this const. If we're not going to modify the list, then it's a good idea to declare the iterator as const. So, You'll notice it's not like the const we had before, it's actually part of the type. Notice there is a underscore there. So it is part of the type. If you just want an iterator that's going to modify it, I'll show the list, I'll show you that in a moment. But if you're using an iterator that does not modify the list, it's actually a const underscore and then the name of the iterator. And I'm emphasizing that because you're used to seeing things declared. You don't say you don't say const underscore string x. You say const space string x, but not with iterators. With iterators, that const is part of the type. We got that, that's important. Okay. So, what is really neat about lists that is not true of arrays, you can insert at the front, but you can also insert in the middle. So I've written a little program that treats a list as a grocery list. Okay, so you're used to a grocery list. In fact, we're going to go to show you. So I created a little program called Grocery List. 
And initially it takes some items. Okay, so here's my initial grocery list. Now, whoops, in addition to getting milk, coke, and Sprite, I think I am going to get, um, what's another drink, tea. So tea, and I'm going to insert it before Coke. So I want tea to be inserted before Coke and after milk. And there it is. It's before Coke and after milk. Okay, now I want to get pears, and I am going to put it Not sure it's returned yet completely, but I want pears and I'm going to put it before oranges. Okay, there we go. We put pears before oranges. Now I'm going to give it an item that doesn't exist. So I'm going to say I want to get nuts and I want to put it before onions. You can see that onions is not in the list, so it puts it at the end. Okay. And just to show you, it would also work, let's say I want um, beans, and I want to put it, I can't actually put it at the end of the list, right? If I say beans and nuts, it will actually go before nuts. So actually, the only way to get it at the end of the list is to give it the name of something that's not in the list. Okay, it's my program. Perhaps I could have written something better, like... Um, a special thing that said end, but that would have defeated the purpose of my example program. Okay, the only thing that I'm going to show you, the entire program is here with grocery list if you want to see it. It's in the lecture notes for today, but here's the workhorse function that inserts an item into the list. Notice I'm being very careful to declare my string objects as const and reference. And because I'm going to modify the list, I'm passing it as reference, but not const, because I plan to modify it. I plan to insert the new item into that list. So the first thing I do is I try to find the target item. So I iterate through the list. And if I find the target, then I'm going to call the insert command. And the insert command takes an iterator and an item that you want to insert into the list. It creates a new list node for that new item and inserts it before lit. So this is really important. Insert inserts before the iterator. Okay, insert inserts before. the iterator, not after. It inserts before the iterator. Okay, if you want it to show how push front is implemented, push front should be equal to the insert with what iterator? Push front, remember, puts an item before the first item in the list. I think I heard it. What is it? Begin. So you would pass it, the iterator returned, if the name of my list was L, I would pass it L.begin because that would insert it before the first item in the list. Push back. How do you think pushback gets implemented? Pardon? Very good. It's end because end returns, actually I can't put a, I still need an argument, because end returns, remember end 
returns something that is an iterator to the sentinel node. Okay, so here is the previous last item. So the new item goes in before the sentinel node and therefore after the last item. So the way pushback is implemented is basically as insert calling L.N. It's not exactly, it's going to do it more efficiently than that, but it's equivalent to it. Okay? So if that happens, we simply break out of the loop. There's no reason to continue if we find it. This is one issue, by the way, a lot of you are going to struggle with. Once you've found something in the list, please don't continue. There's no reason to. Anything you do after this in the list is a waste of time. So break out of the list. Or, yeah, break out of the loop. Don't continue. If you hate break, then set a flag. Okay, some people like flags. I hate flags. The whole reason break was introduced was to get rid of irritating flags. You use the language, in my opinion. Okay, but not everyone agrees with that. Okay, but I like break. So we break out then, and we could just return at this point too. I'd be fine with just having a return statement. The reason I didn't was I wanted to show you that if you got to the end, what you do. So we check after we come out of the loop to see if we're at the end. If we are, then we push back the new item. And that puts it at the end. Notice that if you don't call break here and you just keep going through to the bitter end, you would always also add the item to the end of the list which would be bad. So that also reinforces what I say, which is really you need to get out of there somehow once you're done processing the item. Now, the last thing I want to point out is I just used an iterator here. I did not use a const iterator. And the reason is I'm modifying the list. This insert modifies the list. So when you use an iterator, to modify a list, you no longer declare the iterator as const. Mm -hmm. Does the iterator actually get saved after the for loop finishes? Yes. So whatever the, the question was, does the iterator get saved after you break out of the for loop? As long as you declared it here, outside the for loop, hmm. it will still point to the last item that it pointed to when you broke out. If you declare it right here, which many of you have been in the bad habit of doing, it will not be, it will go out of scope and will not have a value. Okay, because if you declare it right here, then it goes out of scope when the for loop exits and it no longer it's undeclared. The compiler will actually squawk at you and say undeclared iterator. So it's a good idea to declare your iterators actually outside of your roots. Okay, questions about this little program. But as they say with a car, wait, there's more. So you can also delete items from the middle of a list efficiently. So here I wrote a little program that was going to print out items in the list in sorted order. And the way I'm going to do it is by doing a linear search through the list and find the smallest item in the list, which in this case you can see is one. So I'll print one and delete one from the list, which will give me this updated list right here, eight, two, and 10. Then I'll again search through the entire list to find the smallest item, and I find that it's two. So I print two and delete two from the list, ending up with the list eight and 10. Now what is the smallest item in the list? What's the smallest item? Eight. So I print eight and delete it, giving me the list consisting of 10. Of course, 10 is now the smallest item, so I print 10 
and I'm left with an empty list, and because it's empty, we'll now exit. Okay, so here's my workhorse function. It's going to find the minimum item in the list and return it. And as a side effect, it's going to delete the minimum item from the list. So again, I pass in the list by reference because I'm going to modify it, and I don't declare it as const because I plan to modify it. Now I need two iterators. This iterator will go through the list. This min iterator is going to keep track of the smallest item that I've seen thus far. So we start, and this is always a good trick for finding min. Too often I see students try to assign an impossibly large value to min, like say 100,000. And of course what happens is on a test I give a value that's bigger than your so-called impossibly big value and everything messes up. So it's always much better when you're trying to find the minimum element in a collection to start by initializing min to the first item in the collection, which is what I'm doing here. Okay, in fact, it's pointing to that list node. It's not actually the value of the minimum item. It's an iterator that points to the minimum item. Now I use lit to iterate through the list. And if the value of the item pointed to by lit is less than the item pointed to by min, I set min equal to lit. When I'm done, I save the return value. Then I call erase. I don't know why they didn't call it delete. They didn't, they called it erase. So erase takes an iterator. It deletes the item at that iterator. Okay, so erase takes an iterator. Remember we said we're going through the API. Well, we're slowly going through it. List.erase takes an iterator, which I'll abbreviate as iter, and it deletes the list node pointed to by the iterator. So if I had something that looked like here's item 1, here's item 2, Here's item three. Let's say min points to item two. When I call erase, it deletes item two. It makes item one point to item three. It makes item three point back to item one. And item two gets erased. Okay, something very important here. What does min look a lot like now? A dangling pointer. Notice that here I was very careful to put this statement before the erase and not after the erase. If I put this statement right here after the erase, I might not get something because min is a dangling pointer. Min doesn't point to anything anymore. So you can't assume that after you've done a race that you can access the contents of min anymore. That's why I had to save the return value. This is very important. It's an easy thing to make a mistake on, 
you need to save the contents. It's so important, you should put it in your notes. Okay? So if you need to use the value, if you still need to use the value in the delete it node or in the delete it list in the delete it list node make sure you save it before you delete the node because it may not be available later. It may not be available after you delete. Okay, that's very important. Common mistake to make. Okay, and finally, after I erased, erased it, I returned this minimum value. Again, you can look at my sort program to see all the gory details, but this is the workhorse function I wanted to concentrate on. Now, there's something interesting here. It seems logical that min must be declared as an iterator because I call a race. So it's modifying the list. This, however, doesn't seem so logical because I never seem to use lit to modify the list, right? Here, I'm not modifying it. Here, I'm not modifying it. Here, I'm simply assigning the value to min. So logically, you would think you should be able to declare lit as a const iterator. I did. I declared it as const when I compiled, when I first wrote the function. And let's see what happens when I do that. So I'm going to change it. And I'm going to declare it as a const iterator. And I'm going to try to declare or sort. I'm going to try to compile sort.cpp. And I get an error message. Right where I assign lit to min, there is no match for operator equal iterator and const iterator. So what it's saying is I refuse to assign a const iterator to an iterator. Basically it's saying you declared that iterator is const, now you're trying to cheat. You're going to not modify lit, but you're in essence going to transfer its contents to min, and then you're going to delete using min. In effect, it's like a tax loophole. You're trying to use a loophole and the compiler is being like the IRS and saying, uh-uh, there's no loophole. If you declared lit as const, that means you can't assign it to a non-const iterator and then go and modify the list. So you'll see it'll be happy once I get rid of the const. It is all peaches and cream. So the bottom line is if you assign a iterator to another iterator and that iterator does some changes to the list, then the original iterator must also be declared as a list changing iterator. Okay, bottom line, you cannot assign a const iterator to a non-const iterator. And you probably should put that in your notes. You cannot, in fact, I will do that. So you cannot assign
I'm pretty sure you can't go the opposite either. Let's just make sure. So you cannot assign a const iterator to a non-const iterator. Let's just try the opposite for a moment. Let's make min the const op iterator. And let's get rid of this erase because that. And instead, let's do box size dot erase. So what I'm doing is I'm now modifying lit and I'm assigning right here a non-const to a const. Let's see if it will let me do that. Box size was not declared in this scope. You forgot the uh, semicolon. Oh, I forgot the semicolon. Thank you. And box size was what? Box size. Box sizes. Oh, thank you. OK, so the reverse is not true. So I can. Okay, you cannot assign a const iterator to a non, you can assign a non-const iterator to a const iterator. So it's kind of like int and float, where you're allowed to say, float equals int because there's no loss of precision, but you're not allowed to say int equals float because there is a loss of precision. So it's kind of like that. One way it's OK, the other way it's not. OK, I'm going to go back and change my program because I don't want it to be messed up. Sure, it compiles. Good. Okay. Actually, make sure it actually works. Good. It works. Okay. So, any questions about finding or erasing? So, so far, you've seen a bunch of the API for a list. In fact, pretty much all we need. You've seen push front, push back, insert, three insert operations for inserting at the front, the back, or the middle of the list. You've seen erase for erasing an item from the list. Okay. You um, have seen the way to go forwards using a forwards iterator and backwards using a reverse iterator. Okay, I am pretty sure that there is pop back and pop front. Make sure about that. Yep, there is a pop back function that will remove the last item in the list. And a pop front, there should be a pop front, yep, that will remove the first item in the list. OK, so you've seen lists. Pretty simple. The advantage is you can insert anywhere in a list efficiently. Disadvantage is you cannot jump via a constant time operation to any item in the list like you could in a vector. So if you want to find an item in the list, it's order n. OK, so basically, if we're looking at the cost of operations, okay, find is order n because you have to potentially search the entire list. 
insert is order one once you find the insert location. So it's constant time if you know where the insert location is, but if you have to find the insert location, then insert is order N2. So order N, if you must first find Okay, and delete, same thing, it's constant time once you find the delete location, or once you find, yes, once you find the item to be deleted. So that's constant time, but it's order N if you must first find the item to delete. Okay, so those are our find, insert, delete. They're basically all order n operations because you almost always have to do the find first. So this isn't generally the most efficient data structure. And it turns out, in the real world, you don't use lists nearly as much as you use hash tables or vectors or maps or sets, which we'll get to. But they're still important because you still can use them. Now, Dr. Plank has a warning. You can insert into vectors, but you should not. So you can also declare an iterator for a vector, and this is exactly the similar code for inserting into the front of a list. So insert at the beginning, and it does exactly the same thing of reversing the list. But this is very slow because every time you insert into a vector at the beginning, what do you have to do first? You have to move everything else over one. Okay, so you have to make room for it. The problem, if you insert into, you saw that on the exam, in fact. The problem, if I have this very simple vector, 3, 1, 8, and I want to insert 10 at the front, what I'm going to have to do is add one item or element to the vector. Then I have to move 8 to here. I have to move 1 to here. I have to move 3 to here. And I then can add 10. So the problem is each insert is order n. And if I do that n times, that's an order n squared operation. Whereas with the list, when I was reversing, I didn't have to do, that was a case where I didn't have to do a find. I was always inserting at the front of the list. So with the list, the entire program took order n time. Is that clear or not? Okay. So Dr. Plank actually timed it. In fact, he showed you what was going on with that little insert. It's equivalent to resizing the vector, then starting at the right side of the vector, right here, and moving every element over by one, just like you did on the exam. Okay, so he checks to see how fast this runs on a file, 
that has, let's see, 40,000 lines. And you can see that for 40,000, it is 10.47 seconds. Pretty slow. Okay. And I forget whether he did it with lists. Looks like he did not unless, let's just make sure about something. No, he was able to do reverse. He was able to do bin reverse, reverse is, three. what is bin reverse three? Let me find bin reverse three. That's it. That's it. Okay. So here was list insertion, and he was using this exact same thing, except this was a list. Okay. And the other one was a vector. Here it was a vector. So the only difference between these two programs, reverse three and reverse four, was reverse three was using a list and reverse four was using a vector. 10.47 seconds versus 0 0.08 seconds for a 10,000 line file, two hundredths of a second versus 70 hundredths. 35 times slower for a 10,000 line file, something like, what, 120 times slower or worse, maybe 1,200 times slower not quite, 12 and a half, 125 times slower. So don't insert into the middle or front of a vector. The only place you should insert in a vector is at the end. Okay? Now, there is a special type of list called a double-ended queue where you can insert or delete efficiently from the front or beginning of the list. So, a double-ended queue or DQ is a list where it is extremely efficient. to insert slash delete, so both insert and delete work efficiently at either the front or back of the list. Okay, and the reason is it uses a special circular array, which we're not going to teach you. It uses a clever implementation of arrays that we will not discuss in this course. So you can't insert efficiently into the middle of a DQ because it is actually using a very clever array implementations beyond the scope of this course. So if you are going to limit yourself to just processing at the front or back of the queue, you use a double-ended queue. A common application is what we call FIFO queues. So two uses of queues, two uses of DQs. or a use is a FIFO, meaning first in, first out queue. And this is a fancy name for a waiting line. 
FIFO queues, when you get in the line at the grocery store, that's a FIFO queue. They always remove what? In the grocery line, who gets served first? The next person in line, the person at the front of the line. Where do you enter the grocery line? At the back. So it's a first in, first out queue. So anytime you want to implement the equivalent of a waiting line in a program, you use a first in, first out queue, and that's typically implemented as a DQ. These happen all the time. If you submit a print job, it goes into a FIFO queue. When you're sending stuff over the internet, there breaks your message into packets and they go to a router. Typically a router is going to put those into a FIFO queue. Okay, so the first packet, the next packet it sends out is the first in line. When a packet comes in, it goes to the end of the line at the router. So these are ubiquitous in computing. First in, first out queues, they are implemented using DQs. Okay, so Dr. Plank gives an example, his reverse program. The only difference is it's now a DQ rather than a list. DQs, same API as a list, it's just more restricted. What do you think they remove from the API for a DQ or should remove? Insert, Insert. and you don't, so the other, very good. You shouldn't be able to insert into the middle. Erase. They might also eliminate the iterators because presumably you don't need to see anything in the middle of the DQ. Now, in fact, because there are perhaps special situations where you need to insert or delete in the middle of a FIFO queue, it will provide those operations. I mean, think of a line. How many of you have been in a line, you got disgusted at how long it was and you left? right? <laughs> so you actually, even in a DQ, even though it's inefficient, you need a way to be able to delete because maybe something is too long. Similarly, how many times have you been in a line where a usher or someone has come up and essentially moved someone to the front of the line? Same idea. So there are situations where you may have to be able to insert or delete. So it doesn't actually remove those operations, but you should use those operations only very rarely. If they have to be used frequently, you shouldn't be using a DQ. Okay, in general, you only operate at the two ends of a DQ, the front and the back. Okay, and here he has his reverse program again for reversing lines in a file. If you remember, the list program took 0.8 seconds. So this is moderately faster on a 40,000 line file. Okay, I'm not going to go through the next program. You can if you want, but he wrote it only for speed purposes. That program was printing out the last n lines in a file. So if you Look at the Unix tail program. <sighs> what? <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, 18, 19, 20. Okay, 20 lines in the file, right? So if I take tail, the Unix command returns the last 10 lines. If instead I ask for five lines, it gives me the last five lines. So Dr. Plank's writing a program that prints the last n lines in a file. 
And the obvious way to do that is to have some data structure where you add to the end of the data structure. But to prevent, let's say it's a million line file, and you're only printing the last five lines. Do you really want to store all million lines? No. So basically, you want to keep trimming lines off the front of the data structure, right? So you only ever have five lines. Okay, so what you want to do is essentially have something where initially it's one, two, three, four, five, because that's the first five. But when you get six, what you want to do is chop one off the front. When you get seven, you want to chop two off of the front. When you get eight, you want to chop three off of the front. Okay, so you can do this using a list, or you can use it do, using a DQ, or you can do it using a vector. Okay, based on what I've told you, which data structure do you think should be the most efficient? We'll take a vote. How many think that implementing this tail program using a vector is going to be the most efficient? Okay. How many think it's going to be a list? Okay, that's fine. And how many think it's going to be a DQ? Most of you. Okay. It's a DQ, and the reason is a DQ is optimized for inserting at the end and deleting at the front. Okay, anytime you have operations that only operate on the front and the back of the data structure, which is this particular program, a DQ should be the most efficient. So Dr. Plank programmed it up, and he ran them. And those of you who voted for a list, won. So the answer is that while a DQ should theoretically be more efficient than a list, in practice, they're about the same. <laughs> You'd have to get even larger than 100 for a DQ to win. Okay, In practice, a DQ really is not that much more efficient than a list except for really, really large data structures. So I find it amusing that they came up with this super optimized data structure and even on this program, which is printing the last hundred lines, and I think Dr. Plank ran it on a, I forget how big his file was. Forty thousand lines. I think it's forty thousand. So he ran it on a forty thousand line file and printed the last hundred lines. Now clearly the vector lost. Okay, no doubt the vector is no good, but DQs and lists. I'm just telling you, supposedly DQs are optimized for operating on the ends of a list. And should I on an exam? and believe me, I will, ask you, give you scenarios, and ask you for the most efficient data structure, and I give you a program like TAIL, you should answer DQ is the data structure you should use, not LIST. Because supposedly, a DQ is optimized for handling operations that are solely on the front and back of the list. Okay? Good. One last thing for today. Our old friend Diamond Hunt, which you did at the very beginning of the semester in a top coder problem. So you were asked to find the number of diamonds in a string. Okay, that's a diamond. This is a diamond. But in fact, there were more, you're looking here, there's three diamonds. 
And that is because every time you found a diamond, you removed it. So when you end up removing both of these, you end up with a third diamond, right? This one and this one. So actually this has three diamonds. This has no diamonds in it. This one has nine diamonds because each time you delete a diamond, you create a new diamond. I made you use find and um, substring, if you remember. So you would try to find a diamond, and then you would use the substring function to remove this diamond. You would find the portion of the string before the diamond and the portion of the string after the diamond. So I made you write it up this way. You ran an infinite loop. You tried to find a diamond. If you could not find a diamond, then you returned the number of diamonds you had found because you mined out the diamonds. The string is depleted. But if you found one, you incremented the number of diamonds. And then you found the left substring before the diamond and the right substring after the diamond and you concatenated them. Okay? And I did that because I wanted to force you to use find and substring. But that's not very efficient. Okay, why is it not very efficient? Well, we analyze it. The problem is, let's look at this one. How long does it take to find a diamond here? Half the length. And you have to do a linear search. There's no way to get around the linear search. Then, in order to concatenate the left substring with the right substring, I can just tell you it's essentially concatenating half of the string with the other, with the other, with the other half of the string, and that's an order n operation. Okay, so if we're thinking about it, the find takes roughly n divided by two operations. The concat of the two substrings takes roughly n. Okay, so it's roughly n plus n divided by 2. And how many diamonds were in that string? It's roughly n divided by 2. So you're going to repeat this operation n divided by 2 times, which gives you n squared over 2 plus n squared over 4, which is equal to order what? n squared, because we get rid of the constants. That's bad for long strings. So instead, there's a more efficient way to do it. I'm going to sketch the procedure now and show it to you the code next time. The more efficient way to do it is to dump the string into a list where each element of the list is one character from the string. And what I'm going to do is iterate through this list until I find a diamond. Okay, so I'm going to do it until left points to a left arrow and right points to a right arrow like here. When I do that, I am going to delete these, the diamond from my list, and I'm going to reset left so that it points to the list entry before the deletion, and I'm going to reset right so that it points to the item after the deletion. So I delete these two items, 
And, well, here he incremented number of diamonds by one. He is setting new left to point to here. Now he deletes these two things, and he makes new left point or left point to here and right point afterwards. Now he has a diamond right here. Okay, it's a special case because I can't go left. That would put me into the sentinel node. So instead, he makes new left point to the new first element of the list. So left now points to the new first element of the list, and I deleted these two elements. Okay, moving to the right, I find this diamond right here, and I delete it. Now new left is here, right is there, there's no new diamonds, and I return. I will show you next time that this is order n, because I only traverse the list once. So it's much cleaner, or not maybe cleaner, but much faster than using the string approach. And I'll show you also how it's implemented in the code next time. And then we will move on to maps and sets. So we will finish up with the diamond example next time and then get into sets and maps.